Productive Pastor 93. Don't sleep on email. What's up, friends? Welcome back to Productive Pastor, your place to talk about healthy ministry through strategic productivity. I'm Chad Brooks, your host. As always, it's a pleasure to be with you today. However you're listening, stoked that you're tuning in and we're coming on. I've been excited about this episode for a long time. It actually started out as an idea I had in the shower, and when I got out, I quickly wrote on my mirror with a whiteboard marker this phrase, don't sleep on email had this uh, ideas in the note file for a while, and I'm excited to talk about what's going on. You know, email is such a critical and important thing for us to realize. And so many times in conversations with pastors and churches, I find out that, you know, they are sleeping on email. They're not realizing the power that email has. We're going to talk about that. Before that, I want to remind you about the workshop I'm teaching on February 29th, Establish a Growth Game Plan. This workshop is some content I've been for, teaching for the last year with for pastors and normal-sized churches. And really, the whole goal of this is to understand that strategic growth is just that, it's strategic. We're going to talk about a handful of things. We're going to talk about the true size of your church, how to discern that. Talk about what does it mean to declare a focused mission field in order to understand your missional saturation and how missional saturation helps us set those goals We'll go through some tools to determine your growth goals. You're getting tons of calculators, some spreadsheets, some things to aid you inside of that as part of this workshop. It only costs $25, happens on Zoom. We'd love to see you there. You can find a link to this in the show notes, revchadbrooks.com slash ppp slash 93. Now you can jump in and be part of this. Would love to see you there. So in the last episode, uh, three things your database does. I poured in deep into the power of using a database or a church management system for strategic ministry. And email, uh, these two episodes are almost like brothers and sisters because so much of what we're going to talk about today, I'm not going to say it's dependent on you using a database, but if you've got a healthy database system, it's going to make things 10 times easier. Now, Let's talk about email. I talk about email on Twitter a lot, and I hear from some people, they just don't think it's effective. They think that uh, we get so many emails, we don't pay attention to emails, all that sort of things. Friends, one of the most growing segments of online content is not blogs, it's not atomic essays or writing on Twitter or LinkedIn, it's email newsletters, and it's understanding the power of email. And so I'm not going to deny the fact that we might get a lot of emails But I have emails I open up every single week and some every single day because I get so much out of them. I think the work is for us to shift our understanding of email and where we have some janky email practices in the church and and, and what does it mean uh, to to take advantage of this way that people are communicating right now. And we have to be adapting and changing. I'm reading this fantastic book right now that was recommended to me uh, to a mentor. Just started it last night. And just the opening chapter had me floored, but it's by Doug Paul. It's called Kingdom Innovation for a Brave New World. One of the things he talks about is how it used to take 30 years to see massive cultural shifts. And we have them now happening. And this research was you know, right at 2019, early 2020, pre-COVID, that we're now seeing the same level of cultural shifts we used to see every generation happening eight, every 18 months now. You know, the church has to become comfortable with innovation uh, it's just part of who we are, but it's also part of our strategy to reach other people. And so learning to use email and how it is growing and changing and shaping and shifting in our culture now is so important. My own wife works in corporate America. They use Slack for all of their uh, communication amongst their company. So you're seeing you know, the idea of email being these quick, instantaneous, short updates. Uh, that's gone away. You, know, you get that stuff in a text message now or a Slack message, that sort of a thing. Email is a different animal now than it used to be. And so part of this shift is understanding to get past that. You know, the biggest rule I can give you right now is this. Just don't make it boring. So many times in our, our approach to email in the church is either making, sending out announcements about a meeting or we just take our PDF a newsletter that our church creates every week or every month and we find a way to copy that into it. It's absolutely chock full of images uh, it's information overload. It's all of those sorts of things. And I'm going to tango with some of the idea of announcements 
in a future episode and how we digitally communicate those, but we're not going to save it today. We're not going to talk about that. This is it's about not sleeping on email, friends. Now, a couple tools coming into this. Are you using some sort of an email list or email newsletter provider? Uh, I It's not my favorite, but it's the one that's the easiest to use for most churches, especially when it's combined with a database strategy, is MailChimp. The reason I like MailChimp is, is it has a native integration with Planning Center, which is my preferred database. I will come out and say, if you're having any questions about your church database, my answer is going to be move it into Planning Center. I don't get money from them. I'm not a sponsor. I I wish I could have the chance to work alongside of them because I love their product and tool so much. But MailChimp natively integrates within uh, uh, Planning Center people. Uh, I always prefer the most native integration you can find out there. Now, for all the emails and the stuff that I do at Productive Pastor, I use a tool called ConvertKit. And I've never tried to, to link ConvertKit into my church's database because MailChimp is free for, I think, to 500 emails a month. And my small rural church is absolutely not hitting 500 a month of those things. But I know that I can use a tool like if this, then that, or Zapier. And I, I, in theory, I know how to connect to ConvertKit, but you know, MailChimp to Planning Center preferred. I know a lot of churches use Constant Contact, and I know there is integration uh, through Zapier or through what if this, then that between Constant, constant Contact and MailChimp. But that's kind of the tool set. If you're saying, Chad, I don't do any of this. What do I need to start off with? Well, there's two tools right there. In Planning Center, people is 100% free. And MailChimp is 100% free. So even if you can't sell your church on shifting over your entire church management system, I think it's worth it to begin building out tools using those two free resources for the normal size church. So let's get into this. Three things, the reasons you should not sleep on email. The first is this, strategic communication. Because this is what using an email newsletter provider gives you is the ability to build out email segments. Now, you might be saying, Chad, you know, I don't even know what an email segment is. But inside of segmentation, you have the ability to tag and to filter people based off of things. Now, at this point in time, I'm going to be talking, assuming you're thinking through planning center people. Because that's what I'm the most familiar with. But it's also, after all the tools I've seen churches try to use to do this, it's going to be 10 times easier in planning center people. And when you want a native integration between the two, what that means is anytime you build custom lists inside of your database, you can then begin to attach that custom list into a MailChimp segment. Now, you might be saying, Chad, this, I, don't, I really don't, I'm not tracking with what you're going. So think about it this way. Any type of information that you can use to sort and filter people inside of your database, you can then email them directly. So if your database does not work with your email provider right now, fix this, okay? Fix this. One of the things we're going to talk about in the workshop coming up is this idea of what I call active adults. Now, I like to define an active adult in the church by super objective data. The three things I think in in any church you can do, and then a fourth thing that normal-sized churches can do is this. You you can then custom out inside of your your email data, your, your database, and especially if you're using some of the paid tools that MailChimp has, that, make, that, that Planning Center has, it makes it a lot easier. But I define an active adult as somebody who is serving or somebody who is giving or somebody who's participating in any sort of a discipleship group. You can build those things out. Even if you're not using modules, you can do a custom tab and you can identify people as far as that's concerned. The level of, you know, kind of, if you're getting the full meal deal through Planning Center, this is a lot easier than doing it kind of you know by hand, but you can still do it by hand if you're in a normal size church. It won't be that complicated. So just right there, automatically you have a custom list inside of your database of the people who have given given in the last you know whatever uh, date range you set that serve up that that list up as who who served and who has been part of discipleship. Also, if you're in a normal size church and you're taking role on Sunday mornings. Uh, you've got a person who is, you know, you're passing the pew pads, which I'm a fan of, or you're doing a connection card, and you have somebody who just comes in at the end of uh, the week and notates, hey, this person has been in worship at least once this month. You can do a custom tab for that. And you know, at that level, that attendance, that's a pretty objective data marker as well. And so now what you can just do is you can email those people based off of any of those identifiers you give them. Uh, and that, that just begins to change things right so much. So let me give you two case studies that I've used in ministry 
in ways that you know strategic communication through email, utilizing a database and the uh, email newsletter provider helped us do. Both these were almost in church planting, and both of these situations were you know because of the COVID nineteen pandemic. Now, like many of you, my church uh, locked down during COVID. We actually locked down twice. We did, I think, 12 weeks in the spring into the summer of 2020, and then we had to lock down again. We were in a building campaign, and we opened up that facility the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, and two days later, the positivity rate in our county, our parish, I'm in Louisiana, was over 40%, and we realized, you know, we think we have to close down again because COVID was just so absolutely gnarly. So we come out of that lockdown almost, I think, in February, late February of 2021, and we had seen, like so many other churches, our attendance kind of completely nosedive. Uh, and we were worried. I mean, we were in a brand new building. We had a lot more expenses. We had merged with another church. You know, at the beginning of COVID, we were renting an, a single office space from another church for $500 a month. And a year later, we had merged with that church. We had three existing uh, you know, historic buildings and also a brand new $900,000 sanctuary that we were responsible for. It was a lot of change over the last year. And so seeing all these folks that we had not seen in the last year, we began to get a little bit concerned. And so we pulled in and I, I still had a paper list of who our active adults were in February of 2020. Now we went through that and we, every month we ran those engagement lists, those giving, serving, or the in discipleship function. And we realized there was a decent amount of people that were still popping up on that list that we had not seen in worship, and at that point in time, almost a year, that we're still engaging with our church in some way. Uh, we also had people that we knew, you know, they were commenting on the live stream. We were still talking, still had relationships with them, but we'd not seen them in church. And so we went into our database, and we created out a custom tab and planning center, and I just called it C19 present, C19 not present. And we identified every single person who is inside of that C19 not present and what we did was we began changing our, I would send a weekly email to let folks know about what was going on that coming Sunday, like many of you do. I'm not going to get into the strategy, strategies and tactics of that email too much in this episode. But what we did was we quit sending the exact same email to everyone that we had listed in our active database. Uh, I, I changed the last paragraph of that email to the people who were still coming and engaged in the church and seeing on Sunday morning. And then those that were, we, we, we knew were still kind of part of the larger family and that we were not seeing on Sunday morning. And I want to say that list was probably about 65 people. So we came in our database, just made that adaptation so we could see those two lists and those two counts. And we began using email and the sorting features to communicate to them in just different ways that was highly invitational and letting them know we miss them on Sunday morning. And what was wild was, and we were tracking this in this big, huge metric sheet. I'll share about that metric. You get a copy of that metric sheet in the workshop coming up. And we began tracking when we would see those folks begin to come back. And in a lot of ways, we mirrored our new visitor integration system. And we kind of created a secondary one for the folks that were not on that list. And when we saw them again, when we saw them come back again to worship, that we changed our marker in the database, which then put them into a different email segment. And we had a very specific communication we designed. And all of this was automated because that's the thing about using email strategically is you can write these things one time, build them into an automated sequence, and all you just make that one change in your database, and it automatically resubscribes them to this new list and then sends out that specific direct form of communication. And we saw, I want to say, 70% of those 65 folks come back within six weeks. It was all through our ability to segment the congregation with the database and then use email strategically to communicate with them. It was fantastic. It worked great. Another story from almost the same period was we were wrapping up our capital campaign and we were due to move into this building. And we knew we had some folks that had not finished their pledge we had some folks that were active in the church and were part of the church when we started that campaign, but had never pledged. We had folks in the church who had not pledged, but were giving to the capital campaign. And then we had new folks who had started showing up in the two years and had not given towards the campaign. We used a database to make four different lists in that manner. 
And then one of the reasons I love a MailChimp integration is you could email people directly from the list inside of Planning Center. And so we had like a 30-day period where we needed to raise a pretty significant amount of money. It was around you know, $25,000 so we could finish this campaign out and come out of it not owing money to anybody besides the mortgage that we had signed. Um, we came in and just strategically used email, communicating with those, you know, those buckets of people, but also the people who had campaign, who had, had been part of the campaign, had pledged and had fulfilled their campaign pledge. So we had, I think, five different buckets. We used email to communicate to those folks specifically and strategically. I think we sent an email every uh, seven to 10 days for around 40 days. And what was wild was we didn't just hit the goal of what we needed. But we exceeded it by around $10,000 that and there's, there's other cool stories about that season, but that changed the game for what it was like for us to finish out this building, for us to move into it. Both of those scenarios show the power of using a database and email for strategic communication. I cannot imagine having to do high level things Anytime you have more than like 10 people <laughs> that you're leading and not using email in this manner. The second thing, the second reason you should not sleep on email is this. It's strategic development and encouragement. Now, there's something that I talked about pastors all the time. And a lot of times I'm working with churches now that are dealing with, you know, a, a loss of funds. Like, you know, money has changed over the last few years and they're coming into a new budget year and saying like, hey, you know, Chad, we're going to have to pick up like we have a 15% deficit from last year. Uh, we're estimating that level of hole. And this is one of the first things I ask them is this. How often do you communicate with your givers? And a lot of times they look at me and they say, well, you know, we, we send a year end giving summary out. There's that sort of thing. You know, friends, when you're using a database and when you have it linked to an email provider, you can do so much more than that. So here's a couple of things I've done when I was in ministry, uh, serving a church full time that was, you know, full of people of all age ranges. Uh, we were running about 150 on Sunday morning. We had, I think, 280 active adults in some manner. I mean, so, so stuff was pretty wild and woolly. I would send out an email the first Monday of every month to two groups of people. I would send out an email to every single person who had served that month. Now, I had, now, our database is where we scheduled people, and so it took me five seconds to run a list of everyone who had served. And so I sent them an email. It was three or four sentences thanking them for what they did for our church. And then I had five to seven bullet points of, hey, this is some of the highlights of ministry that we were able to do that would not be possible without folks serving through our church. And I, I hammered those bullet points out, and then I thanked them again, and I hit send. The whole thing probably took around 15 minutes to, to run the list, to write the email, to send the list. I did it all from Planning Center. So every single person who served was thanked, but they were also recognized. I would also highlight in that email people who had served for the first time and just give them a little bit of a shout out and, and that sort of thing. Just the recognition and the encouragement was huge there. I would do the same thing the first month of the month to every single person who had given to the church. I would write them, you know, three or four sentences thanking them for their financial gift, how it helped us in ministry, that sort of thing. And then I would write down bullet points, you know, five to seven bullet points of different things our church was able to do because of their financial generosity that month. At the end of that link, I always shared a link said, hey, if you want to, if you need your giving information at any point in time through the year, you can access it through our giving portal. We use Planning Center Giving for this. I put the link inside of there, and then I thanked them again, sent that out every single month. And friends, just those two little things, that two strategy, that contributed so much to us not having pressure points in those two areas. Now, if you're using a database as well, one of the things that you can do since I get so many questions and I have so many conversations with churches now about giving is you can go into your database and very easily run a list of every single person who's in there as an active adult, uh, but has not given in the last three months. And you can write a very, uh, just a, a strategic and intentional email as far as that's concerned. And you don't have to say, Hey, this email is for all the people who don't give to the church. You say, hey, listen, I want to talk, I want to share with you what financial generosity looks like in our church right now and give you an idea of what people are able to do. And one of the things that like we went in and we realized, hey, it takes $25 a Sunday for us to have uh, juice and goldfish crackers for the kids' ministry. 
I'd put saying, no, for 20, no, it, 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 this is what this costs. Um, if, and I would always, it was on the idea of these folks are not giving, let me help them understand how even a small gift can make a huge deal. And that's the thing. Your database can create segmentation and through that segmentation, you can think through how do I develop people and encourage them to take the next step forward in their life in the church. Now, you can also do the same thing with every parent who has a kid in student ministry or every parent who has a kid inside of the children's ministry, this segmentation and then encouragement and development. Now, we would also do something that was really cool. I loved doing this every year, and and there's other ways you can do it, and I'm going to share a strategy at the next step about what this looks like. But one of the things that we would do is we were, I'm a United Methodist pastor. We're serving United Methodist Church. One of our, our traditions is third grade Bible. Now, we would have, you know, anywhere from four to 10 kids a year getting a Bible in third grade. We'd also give Bibles to the kids that were over third grade up to middle school age that had started coming to the church in the last year. And so when, so we'd have to do signups to know how many Bibles to have, how to spell the kid's name, to write out in the front of the Bible, you know, all that sort of stuff. You need to have signups for this sort of thing. We would create a sign up, and back then we were using Google Forms, although they, there was an innovation in Planning Center. We began to use Planning Center for this, where we could just get the kid's information. We also always required the parent to give us their email as part of this. And we went into MailChimp afterwards, and I developed um, an email sequence specifically for this. Uh, they had an email that would come to them the moment they registered their kid, thanking them for registering their kid. And I would just talk about, you know, why it's important for Scripture to be read at home and let them know, hey, over the next couple of weeks, uh, you're going to be getting some emails about how you can read Scripture together with your family. And we had a couple of emails that were scheduled, you know, five days after the person uh, signed up, seven days after the person signed up, uh, that sort of a thing. And then we had five additional emails scheduled for the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, after third grade Bible where I shared a really simple Bible story that they could read with their kids. We had a fantastic kids Bible, and I was also picking out passages that might have some fun additional content that were attached to them in the kids Bible. And then just two or three questions for the family to ask together after they've read the Bible story. You know, we heard from so many parents about how that email sequence, it really made it easier for them to, to talk about the Bible with their kids. What was wild was it actually increased Bible reading with the parents when they realized what was going on. And we wrote this sequence one time. It took me, you know, probably two or three hours to write all the content for it, but we saved it. And every year I would go in and maybe change a couple of things, just update any information that might have dates on it. But we would rerun that sequence, and I'll tell you what, we began to notice a significant change in our older elementary schools, uh, school students, of them with how they use their Bible. The kids started bringing their Bibles to church on Sunday. It changed the culture of Bible reading in our kids' ministry and our middle school ministry while I was there. And I think that email sequence of just resourcing people about this big thing had something to do with it, and it was all automated. That three hours of work combined with maybe 25 minutes of setup every single year when we built out the registration paid off big dividends. It's a great example of strategic development and encouragement. Now, this third reason you should not sleep on email is a little bit higher level, but it's about how to use email for strategic evangelism. Like I said, this is high level. If you are overburdened and you feel like you're working uh, you know, not at the 80% workload like we talk about on Productive Pastor, but you're like, Chad, hey, my schedule right now is like 115% full. Then don't do this. You don't have to do this. I don't want to get you inside of some sort of an email technological arms race. But if you have the margin, think about doing this. Now, my friend Brandon Kelly has talked about this a lot. I'm trying to find the link to uh, an article he wrote where he talks about this more if I find it, I'm going to drop it in the show notes, revchadbrooks.com slash PPP slash 093. You can go find that there. But I want to talk with you about how you can use email and you can use sermon content and how you can use Facebook ads to reach people in your community. And so this is what our, our broader purpose is, is we're going to create a short email course that can be deployed at any time. Because remember, this is automated in order for you to make new contacts inside of your church. Now, this is what I want you to think about, okay? Number one, what are the felt needs that are going on in your community? 
Now, you can figure these felt needs out through the conversations that you have with your church folks as you're just with them, you know, drinking coffee, eating meals, doing discipleship, that kind of stuff. You know, begin to make notes of, okay, the exact same thing keeps on showing up more and more and more. Uh, You can survey your congregation. I think at least once a year, if not twice a year, finding a way to survey your congregation and having just a handful of specific questions in there, you can find out so much about their felt needs of what's going on inside of there. There's also... 